Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I'm not sure where to begin. I'm a CSI agent and thought I'd tell you about one of my cases. For those who don't know, CSI stands for Crime Scene Investigations. Our agents are usually the second people on the scene. We're right after the police or sheriff's department finish their initial walkthrough. It's our turn to start taking in the evidence to help in any way we can. We try to prove innocence or guilt on the evidence. I'm Jim Lee, and I usually team up with Bobby. Her name is Roberta, but she prefers to be called Bobby by her co-workers. She is one nice-looking woman, but when it comes to work, she's all business. We were at the office when a call came in. Two people were shot to death in a motel room. The suspect was found at the scene with gun in hand. Bobby and I headed over to the motel. This looked like one of the easier cases. It's not every day the suspect is standing there holding the murder weapon when police arrive. When we got there, we talked to the lead officer. He told us that they got a call of a shooting. When they arrived, they went into the room. The door was unlocked and slightly opened. On the bed was a white woman with a man on top of her. They were having sex and in fact, he was still in her. He was still lying on top of her, both dead. Two bullet holes, one in his neck and the other in the back of his head. The woman lay beneath him with two bullet holes in her face also. Apparently there were three shots fired and the bullet that went through the male victim's neck went clear through him and into her chin area. The officer also told us that the suspected shooter was standing there with the gun in his hand and dropped it when they entered the room. He looked at the officers and said he didn't do it. He wouldn't say anything else. He was in shock or bewildered. Of course they did their usual cuffing and read him his rights. He refused to talk. As we were talking, another officer was bringing the suspect out of the room in cuffs. I looked up and saw that it was a friend of mine, Mark. His shirt was covered in blood. He saw me and said, Jim, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. My stomach dropped. We went to high school together. I knew his wife Susan was on the wild side, and the last time I saw Mark he told me it looked like he was headed for divorce court if he didn't kill her first. He didn't have to worry about a divorce now. The cards looked pretty stacked against him. Maybe he was crazy and his mind blanked out. I don't know but the evidence would hopefully tell us the truth. Him at the scene, gun in hand, bloody clothes, his wife in bed with a black man. Boy, how could he deny all that? Maybe he was thinking of going for an insanity defense. Bobby and I started in on our task of gathering information. Quickly but thoroughly, we went over the two dead bodies on the bed. An ambulance was there to take them away as soon as we were finished with them. The man was indeed still inside of Susan, and it looked like he climaxed as he was shot. You always read stories about it, but very rarely ever see it. She wasn't quite so lucky. Her face, what was left of it, showed total horror. The police were right. The first shot went through the man's neck and into her lower face around her chin. It looked like a second shot was fired into the back of the man's head and was still lodged in his skull. A third shot was fired into the forehead of Susan. We finished gathering evidence and went outside to look around. We followed procedure and looked for witnesses and tire tracks and whatever else we could find. While we were inside, we found a camera on the floor at the end of the bed and took it with us also. Mark's car was there, and we had it towed to our garage. We called the jail and told them we wanted all of Mark's clothes to check for residue from the gunfire. Three shots at close range should leave some residue. I got a call from the lead officer who said that Mark kept saying he didn't do it and that I was the only one he would tell his story to. Man, I didn't want to get involved in this mess. All the evidence was pointing at Mark, an old friend. What the hell was I supposed to do? I agreed to listen to his story. I did tell him that his whole testimony would be taped. I was still obligated to do my job correctly. I also told him that I always go by the evidence, and right now it was getting overwhelming against him, but that I still keep an open mind till all the evidence is in. I also told him that if or when it goes to trial that I would have to testify as to the evidence. It would include everything he told me now also. I asked him if he still wanted me to hear his story. He said, yes, Jim, I trust you to do the right thing, and began telling his story. I turned on the recorder and sat back and listened. Mark's story. I didn't know what to do. I caught Susan cheating over and over and was now trying to figure out how to respond. We haven't been getting along for quite a while. We were married five years before the problems began. We had two kids, Mark Jr. and Kayla. As you know, Jim, 
Susan and I got married fresh out of high school. I started work in one of the local factories, and she works for her dad in an insurance agency. Her dad is wealthy, but not to the rich standpoint. He's well known in our area and pulls a lot of weight. He didn't mind Susan and I dating in high school because I was the popular high school jock, and of course he told everyone that I was dating his daughter. As luck would have it, I broke my leg in the last football game my senior year. Any chance of a scholarship was gone. I wasn't that smart for any academic type scholarship, so college was out of the question. My parents wanted to try and fund my education, but I told them not to waste their money. I really didn't know what I wanted to do anyway. After graduation and my leg healed, my dad got me on at the factory. It was hard work, but paid well. I did my best since my dad got me the position. He passed on just last year. I really miss him. He was too nice and too young a man to die so early in life. Of course, after Susan's dad found out I wasn't furthering my education, he told Susan that he didn't want her dating me until she turned up pregnant. He was pissed. There wasn't much he could do about it. Susan and I got married before she started showing very much. Her dad wanted her in a white dress. Of course, once the baby was born, everyone figured it out. Either the baby was three months premature or Susan was pregnant before she got married. Big deal. It happens a lot. We were happy and got a small place and settled down. Of course, Susan's dad and I never got along. I wasn't good enough for his precious little girl. We went on and life seemed good. We had our arguments like all couples, but her parents were always interfering. She said she wanted to work instead of staying home with the kids. She started working for her dad as a secretary for his agency. My mom babysat the kids. Susan hadn't worked for three months before our love life took a hell of a dip. She was always too tired or not feeling well. One morning she was getting dressed and was putting on a somewhat short skirt. She wasn't wearing any underwear. What the hell is going on? Now you don't wear panties? I asked. She didn't look disturbed at all. No, I stopped wearing them six months ago. For some reason I kept getting a yeast infection about every three months and when I went to the doctor, she told me to go sans panties. Since I've done that I haven't had a yeast infection. What about periods and times like that? Of course I have to wear them then, but I wear a pad and then it's only for a week. What do you think I do? Show my bum to the world. Most of the women I know don't wear panties unless they have to. I didn't know what to think. I always thought most women wore panties. It's not like I check every woman's bum out looking for a panty line. I knew I would from now on. Our sex life didn't improve, and all I could picture was my wife running around showing everyone her bum. I did talk to a couple of women that I was friends with and asked them if they wore panties. They laughed at me until I told them I was serious. Well, Mark, to be honest with you I both do and don't. When I wear shorts or pants I usually don't wear them. If I wear a skirt or dress, yes, I definitely do. I know guys are going to try and look up my skirt and I guess I don't always sit late alike. Carol was probably my best female friend. If I hadn't been married, I know I would have liked to date her. She was always nice and friendly. She was one of the few women I could talk to about my problems. Thanks, Carol. I appreciate your honesty. And yes, I try and look up your skirt too. You have blue panties on today. I laughed. Guys do that. I don't know any that don't. Maybe all guys are pigs. But a girl in a short skirt or dress will always get my attention. So what about Susan? I wonder if she told me the whole truth. I'm always reading these stories about cheating wives. It seems to me that working women are at a greater risk of having an affair. Granted, stay-at-home moms can cheat too, but working women will get hit on daily. They would seem to need to be stronger in their marriages to fight the onslaught of being pursued. If women also went without panties and men noticed, wouldn't they get hit on more often? So I was thinking, if you take a young pretty woman like Susan, and not the greatest marriage. Our marriage was in deep shit. I needed to do something to try and win her back. When she got home from work, I told her my mom would watch the kids and we could go out to dinner. She kind of grumbled, but agreed to go. It didn't go well. All she talked about was herself, her new friends at work, and how much fun they were. This got me to thinking. Here I was working hard my whole life, and I could never describe being at work or the people there as fun. Why would her place of employment be so much different? She didn't wear panties out to dinner either, and we sat at a table. I tried to watch her eyes and noticed her looking around a lot. There were men in booths behind me, and I think they were getting a show. 
I knew then that we probably couldn't salvage our marriage. I knew deep down that she was screwing around on me for quite a while now. I decided not to even talk to her about it anymore. I had lost my respect for her. Some things you just know. All I needed now was proof. I felt so sorry for our kids. I spent more time with them, and the three of us always did things together. They always ran up to their mom when she came home and told her about their day. She always told them the same lies. Boy, I sure wish I could have been there, but mommy has to work. I wanted to hit her in the face so badly, but I had to think of the kids. It's bad enough they had a mother that was a tramp without having a father in jail. Now, here I am anyway for something I didn't do. Damn it. For the next few weeks, I watched her closely. Whenever she called and said she had to work late, I would have my mom watch the kids and follow her. She was always going out with men from her office. I started taking my camera along and took pictures of her and her friends. She always ended up at motels and I took pictures of them going in. I never got pictures of them having sex, just going into the motel. I'm sure they weren't cleaning rooms. I knew the marriage was over. After the first time seeing her with another man going into a motel, I started planning my divorce. I no longer approached her for sex. Seeing her just made me sick. Every time I looked at her, I pictured her in bed with someone else. It just made my stomach churn. One time I remember telling Susan that if I ever caught her cheating on me, I'd kill both her and the son of a witch she was with. She just yelled back at me that she wasn't afraid of me. She said that marrying me was the biggest mistake of her life. She told me what a lousy lover I was. I asked her, how would you know unless you've bedded down with someone other than me? We were both virgins when we met. So I guess you have been sleeping around. She was nervous now. She was trying to figure out what to say. Finally, she came out with some lame excuse about what she read in some damn magazine and how her friends told her how good their sex lives were. Well, go to hell, you and your magazine. If I find out you have been cheating on me, you're a dead woman. Tell your friends the truth. You would have to screw me once in a while if you're going to compare me. I know this really makes me look bad. First I threaten her, and then her showing up dead with me there. But honest I didn't do it. Susan told me last week, Mark, I haven't been cheating on you, but I want out of this marriage. You're crazy, and I don't love you anymore. Just take your things and go. I'll tell my dad to get us a lawyer and we'll file irreconcilable differences. You can have your stuff and go. Just stay out of my life. I asked her, what about the kids? You're not taking my kids. I don't give a shit who your parents are. They don't do anything for our kids. I want custody and my mom loves them and I know will help me take care of them. Besides, when you go out with your boyfriends, who's going to watch them? I asked. I remember her turning away from me that day and walking away. I know she loved the kids, but to what extent? She wasn't willing to give up her new sex life for them and if I had the proof, I knew I could get custody. I have her going into motels with a number of men from the office. I wanted to get one of her in the act of committing adultery. My lawyer told me that would be all the proof I needed to get my kids. No court would have awarded her the kids or alimony with that kind of evidence. Yesterday, I heard her talking on a phone to a guy when I got home. She didn't know I was there, so I just listened. She mentioned a time in motel so I walked back out of the house and came back in through the front door making some noise so she would hear me. When I walked in she quickly hung up the phone. I asked her who she was talking to, and she said her mother. I already knew that was a lie. I figured I'd follow her, and go to the motel, and break into the room and get the pictures I needed. I would take them to my lawyer, and apply for my divorce. After Susan left the house dressed like a 304, I took our two little kids to my mom's, and asked her to keep them for the night. I figured after I broke into the motel room that there would be a confrontation, and one of us wouldn't be coming home tonight. So. I had mom keep the kids out of harm's way. It took time to get the kids ready and pack them an overnight bag. I grabbed my camera and we left. I dropped the kids off at mom's and I probably got to the motel about a half hour later. I really didn't have a good plan. I'm not a weak man so I figured if there was a fight, I could handle myself okay. I really wasn't thinking that clearly. I can see that now. I located the motel in their room. It was an end room. I was sitting in my car holding my camera when I heard three shots fired. I looked up and saw someone leave the room quickly. I got out of my car with my camera and headed toward the room. I didn't hear any sounds coming from the inside and slowly twisted the door handle and it opened. 
I pushed the door open and saw a big man lying on top of Susan. He must have been having sex with her. They looked like they were both dead with blood coming out of them onto the bed and floor. I looked down and saw a gun. I don't know why, but I picked it up. I was like in a trance or something, staring at my wife dead on the bed with this big man on top of her. I don't know how long I stood there, but a police officer told me to drop the gun and to lay face down on the floor and put my hands behind my head. I did drop the gun as well as my camera and laid face down in some of their blood. I couldn't speak. No words would come out of my mouth. I finally got out the words. I didn't do it. I was then taken outside and that's when I saw you, Jim. Please help me. There it was. His side of the story. Believable? I didn't know. I told him I would go through the evidence and we would see what happens. I asked him about the person he saw leaving the room. He told me it happened too quickly. He didn't see anything but a figure running quickly out of the building. He didn't even know if it was a man or woman. They did have on dark clothing. While I was there at the jail, I did run a test to see if he had discharged a gun lately. It came out negative, but he had taken a shower after he was put in his cell. The residue, if any, could have possibly washed away. When I got back to our lab, Bobby asked me how it went. Do you believe him, Jim? She asked. Bobby, I go by the evidence. It doesn't lie. I hope he told me the truth for his and his kid's sake, but the evidence will have to tell us more. For now, it's not in his favor. Bobby said that the blood on Mark's shirt belonged to both victims. According to the photographs, in the police report he got the blood from lying face down when the officers told him to lie down on the floor. He wasn't anywhere near the victims. Whoever shot them did it from the end of the bed. I told Bobby that I thought the camera belonged to Mark. He said he was taking it in to take pictures of the sex act for adultery purposes. She had already sent them to the lab to get developed. We would probably have the pictures tomorrow. We also had to find out whose gun it was. While Bobby and I were talking, we agreed that the suspect, Mark or someone else, had to know the time and place of the meeting. Bobby did tell me there was no residue on Mark's clothing. She did say he pissed himself, probably when he saw the bodies on the bed. Hmm? Maybe there is something here. We doubt he would have pissed his pants and then pulled out a gun so quickly that they didn't even stop screwing. Maybe, just maybe Mark was telling the truth. The next day was a madhouse. The district attorney was already on our backs. He had gotten a call from Susan's dad and said he wanted Mark put to death. We tried to explain to the DA that we had a lot of evidence to go through. He was caught in the room with the murder weapon in his hand. What more do you need? The DA asked. The DA's name was Brett. Brett, we have a few things that don't come together yet. Nothing big but still unanswered. You could get shot down in court if a good attorney gets this case unless we get the answers, I said. Like what? Brett asked. His finger test doesn't show he fired a gun recently. There was no gunpowder residue on his shirt. His fingerprints on the gun were over top of another set of prints, which we couldn't retrieve. The timeline is bad. Who let him in the room? He walks in the room, pisses his pants, takes a gun and shoots the victims, all the while holding a camera in his other hand. He stands there for what we figure is seven minutes holding the gun till the police arrive. Reasonable doubt, Brett. His attorney just needs reasonable doubt. Give us a few days and we will see what we can find. Damn. I thought this was an open and shut case, cried Brett. Bobby stared at me. You know, after everything you told Brett, I don't think Mark did it, replied Bobby. If he didn't, I wonder who did. We need to see what is on the camera. Also, we need a list of other people who stayed at the motel the last two nights. Maybe there might have been a witness. By the way, do we have any information on the male victim? I asked Bobby. His name is Tony Williams, early 40s, married and works at the same insurance office, replied Bobby. Since Mark's mom had temporary custody of the kids, she was allowed to keep them till this case was over. Susan's parents really didn't want anything to do with them. The next day Bobby came in with all the pictures. Mark had a digital camera with over a hundred pictures on it. All of them were of Susan with different men. There had to be at least 20 different men. Our first thought was that maybe she was a hooker. Eventually we figured out she just liked to have sex with different men. In a number of photos, the men were taking liberties before even going into the motel room. It was a wonder Mark didn't go off the deep end. He told us later that he kept thinking of his kids to keep his sanity. We headed over to the insurance agency where Susan worked. Many of the men in the pictures were employed there. 
we were greeted by Mary Brandt. She was the receptionist, mid-forties, dressed overly sexy for an insurance office, but very nice looking for her age. She paged Mr. Davis, Susan's father who tried to tell us about wasting our time. We had the killer and needed to prosecute him. We asked Mr. Davis if we could talk to him in private. He took us into his office and we sat down. What the hell is this all about? asked Mr. Davis. Well, sir, there is a slight chance that Mark might not have been the killer. We have to close a few doors before filing the charges. We have photos of your daughter with other men. Unfortunately, we have to talk to them, and many of them work here, I replied. Bullshit. You have your damn killer, he screamed at me. I took some of the photos of his daughter with a few of the men in the agency with them going into motel rooms. Here, Mr. Davis, I didn't want to bring this up, but we have more pictures of your daughter with other men. I can't believe this was going on in my own business, my own daughter. These son of witches are going to pay. Mr. Davis, we need to talk to these men. What you do afterwards is not our business, but we need to talk with them all now. Mr. Davis called his secretary, and she led us to a room and had 12 different men from the agency come in one at a time and talk with us. They all said about the same thing. Most of these men were either married or divorced. None were single. Makes you wonder how many divorces might come from this one woman's sex addiction. Why are so many men so weak? She started strutting her stuff in front of everyone. Hell, she was a good-looking piece of shit. She would sit at her desk and spread her legs, showing off that kitty. How can anyone not take advantage of her? On top of everything else, she was the boss's daughter. That alone made it worthwhile. A number of responses were very similar to that one. She was always showing off her kitty. What's a guy to do? Said some. A few men denied having sex with her till they were shown the pictures of them going into a motel with her. A couple even said they wouldn't talk to us without an attorney present. We explained that we were just checking out leads but if they felt they needed an attorney present that we would oblige, but it would be made known and probably throw out a red flag. Most talked to us after that. One guy, Bill, was in love with Susan. He wanted her to divorce Mark and he was going to divorce his wife and marry her. He was really mad when he found out most of the office had relations with Susan. When he found out she was having a date with Tony, he was really pissed. He loved her and she was going to have sex with a big man. Of course, no one admitted to the shooting. We really did wonder about Bill. He was almost off the deep end. He was definitely on our short list, along with Mark, of course. They about all asked if we were going to tell anyone about their actions with Susan. We just told them that we had a private report, but that their boss knew about the situation. We knew it would be one messed up office after we left. We still hadn't found any evidence to clear Mark. Actually, he had all the more reason for revenge. Our next stop was Tony's house. We needed to talk to the big male victim's wife. Tashika Williams was her name. A good-looking woman in her 30s. She came to the door in a somewhat sexy nightgown and a silk robe. Can I help you? She asked. Mrs. Williams, we are with CSI Crime Team and have a few questions to ask you about your husband, Tony. First, we would like to convey our condolences. We know this is a bad time for you but we have to gather whatever information we can as early as possible. May we come in? She looked a bit nervous, but invited us in. We asked all the basic questions, including, of course, her whereabouts the night before. Look, she said, Tony and I were talking about getting a divorce. We weren't getting along very well. He started cheating on me and I kicked his bum out a few days ago. I didn't kill him and besides, didn't they catch the guy with the gun in his hand? She asked. Yes. There is a suspect, but we aren't sure he is the killer. We have to check all the evidence. Where were you last night, Mrs. Williams? Right then a man came through the hallway. What's going on, Tashika? Who are these people? The man asked. They're investigating Tony's murder. They want to know where I was last night, Tashika laughed. She was in bed with me screwing up a storm. If it's any of your business, the big man replied. May I ask your name, sir? I asked. Angel White if it's any of your business. Tashika and I were here all night. Go check our bedsheets if you want. Stupid Tony gave up Tashika for that fat bum Tamara. What a fool. Tamara? Who's Tamara? I inquired. Tony's new girlfriend, or at least was. Didn't she get murdered at the same time with Tony? Angel asked. Do you have Tamara's address? We would like to talk to her. In answer to your question, 
Tamara wasn't with Tony last night. Sorry, we can't tell you any more right now. Tashika said, better watch it when you go see Tamara. Damon, her husband, is a maniac. I don't know if he knows about Tony and Tamara. Bobby and I left Tashika's house. What a mess. Mark's wife sleeps around with God knows how many guys. He could be facing two counts of murder. His wife's dad didn't know that 12 of his agents had slept with his daughter. One of the men, Bill, loved his daughter and was willing to divorce his own wife to marry her. The last man Susan slept with was a married big man whose wife kicked him out and was sleeping with another man already. Now we find out Tony had a girlfriend and she is married. This sure wasn't as open and shut as the DA hoped for. We stopped by Mark's mother's house on the way back to the office. We had a couple of questions for her. Mrs. Moore, I'm Agent Jim Lee and this is my partner Agent Bobby Burke. We are investigating Mark's case. May we have a word with you? I asked. Sure, officer. Is my Mark all right? I know he didn't do that terrible thing he's being accused of. He's a good father and was a good husband. He just wanted a good marriage and nice family. I hate to talk about the dead, but Susan was a bad woman. She had two of the greatest little kids and never spent any time with them. Oh, I'm sorry, officer. I get to talking and I can't seem to stop. What can I help you with? Anything for my Mark, she replied. Do you know if Mark ever owned a gun? I asked. Yes, he does. His father passed it down to him before he passed away. He keeps it here at my house. Come with me and I'll show it to you. She unlocked a drawer and there was a 9mm Luger in the drawer. She said he kept the bullets in another room because of the kids. He did take it out to the shooting range once in a while. He also owned two shotguns that were locked up in the basement if we would like to see them. Did you know he was going to confront Susan the other day? I asked. Yes, he took his camera to take pictures. I told him not to go but of course he didn't listen to me. He just wanted out of his poor excuse for a marriage and to keep his kids. No way would he have shot Susan and that other man, she replied. Well, thank you, Mrs. Moore. You've been most helpful. The following day, we stopped by the jail to see if Mark could remember anything else. He pretty much drew a blank. He said his attorney stopped by and told him to plead insanity. He told his lawyer he was pleading not guilty because he didn't shoot anybody. We checked to see if he had any other visitors and his friend Carol from work had showed up two days in a row. Bobby went to see Carol and I was called down to the autopsy lab. We were right about the shooting and how they probably occurred. Both victims died from the shot to the head. Both had the bullets removed from their skulls. Susan also had the other bullet removed from her throat area. Then the doctor hit me with some disturbing news. They had run blood tests and both victims were HIV positive. The virus that causes AIDS. Now we had a whole new ball game. Was the shooter after Tony, Susan, or both? Damn, this sure wasn't getting any easier. I called Mr. Williams up and told him he needed to get all his employees together that afternoon for a short meeting. The health department and a representative of their insurance company would be present. After he balked about it, I told him his daughter and Tony both had shown positive for HIV and he could have an epidemic if it is not caught quickly. He agreed to set up the meeting. I told him not to mention it to anyone. We had no idea where it started, but everyone needed to be informed together. Bobby came back from talking to Carol. She told me that she believed Carol was in love with Mark. According to Carol, the two of them were the best of friends but had never been intimate. She was willing but Mark said he wanted to wait until after his divorce. He didn't want to cheat just because Susan did. Bobby also told me that Carol said she was home alone the night of the shooting. I guess that leaves us with another possible suspect. We attended the meeting of the insurance agency. There were approximately 30 employees in all. They were all at the meeting. I was the first to speak. I just told them that an autopsy was done on both Tony and Susan, and both of them were HIV positive. The room went totally quiet. It meant that anyone having sex with either of them might have the virus also. The health inspector took over the talk. He explained that anyone having sex with either person needed to be tested for the virus. Also, any other people such as their husbands and wives would need to be tested, and of course anyone else they had unprotected sex with needed to be tested. He told everyone the results would be held in confidence. He did tell them that just because they had unprotected sex didn't mean they automatically had the virus. The insurance representative for the company's health insurance stated that all tests would be covered by their insurance. 
If anyone chose not to have the test at that time, it would not be covered for the test for the next six months. They wanted to make sure they stopped any possible epidemic now. He did tell everyone that they had two days to inform their spouses or significant others and make appointments for their testing. We recorded this meeting on a videotape. We wanted to see the expressions on the faces of the people. We were wondering if anyone knew about the virus before today. About a third of the people went home without signing up for the tests. We hoped it was because they had monogamous marriages. It left approximately 20 employees to be tested. I could imagine what would happen when they went home to tell their spouses. I heard people say over and over, they were neat and clean people. I would have never thought they were carriers. Bobby and I had a couple of more stops to make. We headed over to see Tamara and her husband. I knocked on their door and a lady came to the door. I figured it was Tamara. Hello, I'm Agent Jim Lee, and this is Agent Bobby Burke from the crime lab. Are you by any chance Tamara Gray? What do you want here? She asked. We are investigating the shooting death of Tony Williams and another lady. Do you know Mr. Williams? We are told you are very close friends with him. You better leave before my husband gets here. Tony was just a friend. A car pulled up and a big man got out. What's going on here? What are you people doing on my property? Asked the big guy. Mr. Gray, I'm Agent Lee, and this is Agent Brandt from the crime lab. We are investigating the shooting death of Tony Williams. The moron deserved to die. One time he tried to put the make on my Tamara, but she didn't let him get close to her. Did you, honey? I just need to know where the two of you were last night between 7 and 10 o'clock, I said. What the hell? I didn't kill the scumsucker. I might have if he ever came back to bother Tamara. I was hanging out with my homeboys and Tamara was home watching the television. Now get the hell out off my property. Thank you for your time and, just so you know, Tony tested positive for HIV. Good thing Tamara said no to him. Tamara looked scared to death as we left. We wondered if she was going to tell her husband. We notified Tony's wife about the virus so she and her latest boyfriend could get tested. We stopped by and let Mark know about the HIV testing. He shook his head and said he would get tested, but he hadn't had sexual relations with Susan for about six months and the last two times she wanted him to wear a condom. He said he hadn't had sex with anyone else. We stopped back at the office and watched the video of the insurance meeting. We wanted to see the faces of the people when the HIV was mentioned. Horror was on the faces of most of the employees. They all looked rather stunned. That is all except one person. We ran copies of pictures of a few of the individuals. I was looking over at Bobby while she was making copies of the pictures and thought what a nice-looking gal she was. We were both single and had a lot in common. I thought about asking her out sometime. I definitely had to give it some serious thought. The phone rang, and it was the motel manager. He said he might have some information and a possible witness. The only problem was that it was a drunk. We told him we would be right over and drunk, or not we needed to talk to him. We still wanted to know how the suspect got into the room without making noise. Surely two people don't go into a motel room, take off all their clothes and start having sex with the door open or even unlocked. Mark told us that he saw a person leave and left the door ajar. It makes more sense than anything else we had going. But how did they get into the room without a key? We stopped in to see the motel manager and the clerk that was at the desk that night. We asked the clerk to explain everything he could remember about that night and to please leave nothing out. The clerk began. A good-looking tall big man came in for his key. A woman reserved the room earlier in the day. He came up to the desk and he paid for the room, so I gave him the key. He said, thank you, and left. So you never saw the woman? I asked. Not then, I didn't, but a few minutes later a woman came in and asked for a second key. She said she would be going out and didn't want to disturb her boyfriend when she came back. She told me the correct room number and the name of her boyfriend so since he just left the office, I gave her the key. I handed him the photos that Bobby ran off and included two of Susan. Do you see a picture of the woman you gave the key to here? The clerk looked through about a dozen pictures and handed me one. This is her. A nice looking lady. She was dressed in black, the clerk replied. Are you sure? There's no doubt? Bobby asked. I'm positive. Why do you keep asking me? The clerk responded. It's because the person you gave the key to was not the victim, Bobby replied. Oh my God, I didn't know. The police didn't let anyone near the room, 
so I just assumed it was that woman. It's okay. You did the right thing in calling us. Where is the drunk gentleman you spoke of? The manager took me to a room around the corner and knocked on the door. Fred, the police are here to see you, the manager said. Fred opened the door and we introduced ourselves. Fred said that the night in question was a nice evening and he sat with his door open and was just having a beer when he heard what sounded like gunshots. He had his television on an old western and just thought he had it on too loud. A few seconds later a woman ran by his door, got into a car down the lane and sped off. She kind of tripped in front of the door and broke the heel on her shoe. He said he picked it up and set it on the dresser in case she came back for it. She never did. Didn't you hear sirens shortly after that? Did the police come and talk to you? When we came around the corner, your room was dark. I was half drunk. As soon as I picked up the heel, I closed my door and turned off the TV and the light and went asleep. It wasn't till today that Bob, the manager, told me about the killing. He told me I should talk to you and that's about it. Don't know if it helps you any, Fred replied. Would you be able to identify her from a picture? No, she just kind of ran by, except for the heel thing. She was wearing black and even had on a fancy kind of black hat. I would say, she could have been a light-skinned woman. As I said, I didn't see much. Do you still have the heel of her shoe? Bobby asked. Yeah, it's right here. Don't touch it anymore. We may be able to get prints off of it, I said. Bobby put on a pair of gloves and put the shoe heel in a plastic bag. We thanked Fred and the motel manager for their information. We now had another suspect with details surrounding her. We headed back to the office and lab to piece our information together and to find out who owned the gun. Bobby took the heel to the print lab while I check on the gun ownership. The gun was registered to the victim, Tony Williams. Now we had to wonder how he was killed with his own gun. Bobby returned with the fingerprint match on the shoe heel. There were two sets of prints, one belonging to Fred the alcoholic and another set belonging to our new suspect. We had to call a judge to get a search order ready. While we were wanting for the search order from the judge, the DA showed up. He told us he could only hold Mark one more day or file charges against him. We told him we had another suspect and we were leaving with a search warrant. I told him to do what he had to do, but we felt that he might have a new suspect in custody by morning. Bobby and I headed over to the home of Mary Brandt, the receptionist. I knew it was late in the evening, but this couldn't wait. We had two sheriff's deputies with us. I knocked on the door and Mary Brandt looked surprised to see us. Mrs. Brandt, we have a search warrant to search your home, I said. What on earth for? You got your killer. Why are you harassing me? We have a warrant to look for a black dress and a pair of black shoes. Please let us in or we will have to arrest you for impeding our investigation. She let us in and sat very nervously on her couch not saying anything. The officers went into her bedroom and brought down two black dresses. We didn't know which one she would have worn that night, so we gave her a receipt for both of them. Bobby came out from the garage and had a set of high heels with one heel missing. She found them in the trash. Mrs. Brandt, these will be returned as soon as we run some tests on them. We are sorry for the inconvenience, but this is information we needed. It was standard talk that we gave when taking evidence. We headed back to the lab and Bobby ran the gun residue test. There was residue on the front of one of the dresses and the heel indeed fit the broken shoe. We were pretty sure we had our shooter, but why did she do it? The next morning we went to see Mrs. Brandt at the agency. We took along a uniform officer who would be making the arrest. Brett, the DA stopped by and asked to come long. As we walked into the office, Mary looked up and looked scared as tears started to form in her eyes. We asked Mary to come with us down to the station for questioning. Walter Davis came out and asked what we were doing. We explained that we were taking Mary in for questioning and we would talk with him later. The deputy cuffed her, which surprised Mr. Davis, and she was put in a squad car and taken to the police station. I spoke first and gave Mary her rights. Mary, we know you did the shooting. We have eyewitnesses who saw you. The clerk, when you got the key and a man seeing you flee from the room moments after the shooting. Your black dress had residue stains on it from firing a gun. We also have the broken heel of your shoe with your fingerprints on it. We know you killed Susan and Tony, but we would like to hear your side of the story. Mary knew it was over. There was no way she could hide it any longer. We did uncuff her and the DA, Bobby and I listened to her story. Mary's story. 
I was the queen in this agency before Walter brought his daughter in here. I was the one that all the men looked at. The one they dated and had sex with. I had my pick of the litter as far as these men were concerned. They wanted me, and I was happy to oblige them for many years. I know I was older but men like experienced good-looking women like me. It was me who got all the attention till that 304 started working here. Her daddy thought she could do no wrong. She would sit there day after day, showing her kitty to these men. They no longer came to me for sexual favors. They went to that 304 Susan because she was younger. I hated her. Tony still came to me. He was one of two big men that worked at this firm. When he first came to me I went with him because of that fantasy. I fell in love with Tony, not because of his size. Hell he was smaller than a lot of the other men. His tool was half the size of Walter's. The thing about Tony was he was so charismatic. He had a way of sweeping women off their feet. I've been divorced for three years, and I started having sex with Tony a year ago. About three months ago, he told me I was the best woman he had ever been with and was going to divorce his wife and marry me. I was so happy. I finally wouldn't have to hide the fact I had sex with this wonderful big man. He would be my husband. I know I was a few years older than him, but he said it didn't make any difference. After that, I let him have me any way he wanted. Last week I broke out in my vaginal area. It was a yeast infection or rash of some kind. I went to my gynecologist and she ran some tests. She called me the day of the shootings and said she had some bad news. I was in the early stages of AIDS. I was devastated. I went to the ladies' room and cried. After regaining my composure, I gave it some thought and decided to go on and try to enjoy my life. The doctor said that there were some treatments to help ease the pain, but there wasn't any cure. About an hour later I got a call from Tony. He was in his office and asked me to reserve him a room at the motel. I thought it was going to be for us so I agreed and hung up the phone. After confirming the reservation, I was going to call Tony back and tell him about being infected with AIDS. As I went to hit his phone button, his phone light came on. It meant he was making a call. I don't know why I did it, but I hit my mute button and listened in on his call. He called that 304 Susan. It was her he was going to have sex with that night. After talking to Susan, he hung up his phone and left out the back way so he wouldn't have to face me. I cried as I went back to his office. Everyone else was gone for the day. I have the extra keys to all the desks. I knew he kept a revolver in his bottom left-hand drawer. I opened the drawer and removed the revolver and put the bullets in it. I didn't care anymore. I had AIDS and the man I thought loved me was going to screw a 304 I hated. All I had left was revenge. I knew the motel and the time of the meeting since I made the reservation. I drove over and saw Susan waiting in the car while Tony went in and got the key to the room. I have been with him often enough to know he only gets one key. Once they entered the room I went to the desk clerk and asked for a duplicate key. He looked surprised but didn't question it as he gave me the key. I thanked him and then parked my car around the opposite side of the building. I walked slowly to the door and I could hear them already having sex. She was saying, come on Tony, give me that tool. They kept talking back and forth and I was able to slip the door key in and I opened it quickly. I already had the gun pointed at the back of Tony's head. I pulled the trigger and the bullet must have gone into his neck. I didn't even hear Susan scream. The bullet must have passed through Tony and into Susan. I fired another shot immediately into the back of Tony's head and he fell forward on top of Susan. I took a step forward so Susan could see me as I fired the third shot into her forehead while she was looking at me. I wanted her to know that it was me. I loved seeing the horror on her face. I dropped the gun and ran out of the room, not even closing the door. As I turned the corner to go to my car, my heel caught in a grate and broke off. I went home and sat down and fell asleep. I didn't know till the next day that Susan's husband Mark was there and they pinned the murder on him. I just decided not to come forward. Can I ask you why you suspected me? At the HIV meeting, you were the only person who wasn't surprised to hear the news. We took your picture along with a few others and got lucky. You said you had sex with Walter. Does he know you're infected? I asked. No, I guess he should know now. I think his wife might be a bit surprised. She never much cared for me either. What's funny is that none of these men wore condoms. I couldn't get pregnant so I liked the feel. They all seemed like clean shirt and tie guys. I guess it's true that you can't judge a book by its cover. Walter and I have been having sex for a good six years. I wonder who gave me AIDS.
I guess I'll never know. The DA booked her on two counts of first-degree murder. We were filing our paperwork and closing all the loose ends when Bobby looked at me and smiled. What? Why are you grinning like the cat that caught the mouse? I asked. Bobby replied, I was just thinking how this case could make one good television show for CSI. Nope, never happened. You need some dating or love between the main agents, I responded. We could do that, couldn't we? She asked. Are you saying you will go out with me, Agent Bobby Burke? All you have to do is ask, Agent Jim Lee, and the answer will be yes, she smiled. Mark was released from jail, and Carol was waiting for him. It was tough on the kids for a while, but between Mark's mother and Carol, the kids should be okay. Mark and Carol are dating regularly. They take the kids with them every chance they get. Mark's test for HIV showed negative. He did tell me privately that he and Carol have gotten together, and he does wear a condom. At least for now. Mary pleaded innocent by reason of insanity. She lost and was found guilty of two counts of premeditated murder in the first degree. She will be serving two life sentences without a chance of parole. The whole insurance agency is a mess. We don't know how many cases of HIV came out of it, but we know there were at least a few and also quite a few divorces. Walter Davis, Susan's dad, was tested positive for AIDS. His wife is suing him for divorce, but wouldn't tell us her test result. Tony's wife and her boyfriend were both tested. We don't know the outcome of their tests. Tamara is in intensive care after being beaten by her husband, Damon. He is in jail awaiting his trial for assault and battery with intent to kill or maim. We assume she told him about her affair with Tony. Now it leaves Bobby and me. I picked her up for our date. She looked beautiful. Blue satin blouse with the top three buttons undone and a short black silky type skirt. Bobby, you are one beautiful woman. I can't believe you would go out with me. Is this because you're hoping for a shot at TV? I laughed. No, it's because I've had a crush on you ever since we met. I was just waiting for you to ask me out, she answered. I looked down at most of her thigh showing. Jim, stop looking at my legs. I know you're wondering if I have panties on since that crazy case we just had. She was both smiling and laughing. Well, do you? I smiled. I'm not going to tell you. It's your next case to solve, she laughed. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.